Welcome, congregation, to our evening worship service. A special welcome to anyone who may be joining with us tonight as a visitor. We're glad that God's providence has brought you to join yourself with us as we worship our Lord this evening. Our call to worship tonight is taken from Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4. It's entitled a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day, and the psalmist writes, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands." Let's prepare ourselves for worship with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge as you are our Lord. You are the faithful Lord. You are the unchangeable Lord. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so all throughout human history, it has been good to declare your loving kindness in the morning of the Sabbath day and also to reflect upon your faithfulness in the evening hours of the Sabbath day. And so we pray that you would remind us of your works, works that have granted us gladness as we reflect upon the salvation which is ours uh, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that we might have a reverent spirit of triumph as we acknowledge who you are and what you have done for us, and that we might truly be enabled to express our thanks and our gratitude tonight also Uh, with the songs of praises that we take upon our lips and with the profession of faith that we speak, giving expression of the truths that we hold dear in our heart. Uh, We ask then that you would meet with us tonight, that your name might be honored and glorified among us and by us, and that our souls might be nourished and refreshed on this Sabbath day. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. For our opening song of praise, we'll turn together to selection 92A, and we'll sing stanzas 1, 2, and 5. The first two and the last stanza, standing if able, of 92A. Continually, and so also this evening, we begin our service by expressing the reality that our help is in the name of the Lord, who has made the heaven and who has made the earth. And he greets us tonight with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
As a congregation, we then take the opportunity to express what it is that we hold dear within our hearts in the exercise of faith, the basic truths of our Christian faith as they are put to words in the Apostles' Creed. And so with one voice, we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's then take the opportunity to call upon the name of our Lord together as a congregation in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you that by your favorable providences we have the opportunity again this evening hour on this Sabbath day to gather ourselves together freely without any hindrance from local authorities and also in a place of comfort and ease. Here in these facilities, we can come and we can devote ourselves to a very special, unique, peculiar purpose, uh, that of reflecting upon your greatness and your power, your grace and your mercy, your love and your compassion, and reflecting and also expressing our appreciation, our worship of you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the heritage that is ours. Uh, Many of us, maybe most of us, have had this practice of corporate worship in Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings from our very infancy. We don't know any different. And while we're thankful for that heritage and that upbringing, we pray, Lord, that what we do might never become a mere matter of routine. May we realize the significance of the actions in which we are engaged that we come for one purpose, and that is to worship the living God, the God who has created all things, the God who upholds all things, the God who governs all things, the God not only of creative power, but the God of saving power, the God who speaks and gives life, the God who saves, the God who adopts us as children, giving us all the rights and the privileges and the blessings of that status. And as we reflect upon the week gone past and as we anticipate the week that lies ahead, uh, Lord, may we live out of that identity that we are children of God by virtue of your gracious adoption through the work of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we know what it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, exercising faith in his finished work for the forgiveness of our sins. And we do pray for the forgiveness of our sins. And following after Christ, uh, seeking to offer all that we are and all that we have into his service. And so we ask, Lord, that especially through the means of grace in this day, but also day by day as we exercise ourselves in our, in our private means of grace and in prayer and in, in Scripture reading, that you would give us spirits of hope and, and spirits of joy. May we not be 
uh, a discouraged nor a downcast people, but may we be a people characterized uh, by a spiritual optimism. And, and may that even be witnessed by those who live and, and work and recreate around us. Uh, Father, may we as a congregation be uh, a powerful presence within our communities, uh, bringing forth a good witness for our God. As we go in the week that lies ahead, Father, we, we pray that you would watch over us. Uh, we're thankful that in the display of your majesty in the realm of creation with the severe weather this past weekend, uh, that we have been spared from, from harm and from danger. Uh, we have heard reports that there are areas uh, that have indeed experienced uh, some structural damage, and we ask for successful relief efforts to those areas. But it again reminds us of how dependent we are upon your providential care. And so, Lord, watch over us as we travel, as we commute back and forth to our daily activities, uh, as we engage in our work, and as we just simply go through life. Not only physical protection, although we earnestly pray for that, but we pray too for spiritual protection. For we know that this world is no friend of the Christian. And so by your word and by your spirit and by your providence, keep us from temptation and grant us strength when we do encounter trials that we might remain steadfast in our commitment to the Christian faith. Father, we pray for a blessing upon uh, those who are downcast. We ask that you would strengthen and encourage them. Uh, those who are troubled, grant them wisdom. Uh, those who are ill, we pray, Father, for healing and for strength. Uh, those uh, we think especially of are uh, Norman Jan Dieleman. Uh, we ask for uh, favorable uh, advancements in, in his treatment. Uh, also, we pray, Father, for the family members of these individuals. Uh, and so we, we pray for Bernice Dieleman and ask that you would comfort uh, the mother's heart as uh, she goes through a time of trial as well. Uh, we think of individuals who, who struggle with difficult circumstances, perhaps within their, their, their psyche or their e emotions or, or their mental constitution. Uh, Father, we live in a, in a broken world. We know that you shine in all that's fair, but we know also that there is much brokenness, and we pray for a fullness of life to be given to your people. Uh, bless those who care for these individuals. We, we thank you for our hospitals and for our doctors and for our nurses and for first responders. We thank you, Lord, for their, their knowledge and their wisdom uh, and their, uh, their servant hearts. We think also of caretakers in various facilities. Uh, we know that there is uh, much that needs to be done, and we pray that you would bless these individuals. Uh, we think also of the good order that we have within our, in our community and we pray, Lord, that that good order would be maintained. We ask for a blessing upon the young people of our congregation as they, as they enter exciting but also uh, perhaps new ventures in life, whether it be uh, picking up vocational labors. Bless them in their labor. May they find a sense of satisfaction within their work. Uh, we pray for those who are college or university students as they come to the end of uh, a year, and as the intensity of exam preparation, Lord, grant them a strength and clarity and also success with their studies. Uh, those who are graduating from, from high school or, or from college, those who are engaged to be married, all of these milestones of life, Father, bless these individuals in, in their way. Uh, we ask tonight also for success upon the gospel ministry. Uh, this pulpit, the pulpits in our communities, may they be faithful, may they proclaim the gospel. Uh, we ask too tonight especially for a blessing upon the church plant in Santa Clarita, California with Reverend Lee Irons. Provide for your churches, Father, we, we implore you, provide for your churches men who are qualified and who are willing to fill the offices of elders and deacons. And may the church plant there in Santa Clarita and also other places be, become self-sustaining by your favorable providences and, and may eventually it become organized as a church. Uh, bless uh, their labors as they seek to 
teach various university students and the beauty of Reformed theology, and, and may we also in our community uh, have an interest and an opportunity to explore such ventures to teach those who perhaps are interested in uh, knowing more about the faith. Uh, we pray, Father, for our schools. We're thankful for them, and we ask for a blessing upon them. And here also there is, uh, from our perspective, uh, a shortage of personnel. There are, there are many positions that, that must be filled, and, and we know that you are an all-wise God, and you are a providing God, and so we pray that you would in due time uh, give us uh, gifted teachers, teachers of biblical conviction, uh, but also who have the ability to communicate truth uh, to students. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the land in which we live, and we ask that by the influence of the Christian community that the sanctity of biblical truths and of creational ordinances might be upheld. We think especially of, of human sexuality. Uh, Lord, we pray that You, by law enforcement and legislation and, and by protection with even within our, our communities, that such horrific sins as human trafficking uh, might be restrained and, and might become non-existent. We pray that each human person might be valued and that their life might also be valued as it bears the image of God. We ask for there to be a re reformation in regards to the honoring of the Lord's day. We pray for a, a true spiritual awakening, and, and we think also of uh, the, the sanctity of even labor. Uh, we, we are bombarded by the advertisements of, of gambling and, and, of, and of betting, and we're reminded of the statistics of how many young men uh, are addicted to such immoral exercises, and we pray, Lord, that we might turn away from such things and that we might find great delight in following after the creation ordinances motivated by Your grace. And tonight, as we turn our attention to uh, a difficult topic of human depravity, we ask for balance in our preaching, a biblical balance. Uh, may the corruption of humanity be set forth, but also the remedy for that corruption your sovereign grace, that we might then leave uh, this place of worship testifying in our hearts and to one another that indeed it has been good in this day to be in the house of the Lord our God. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll then turn to a song of preparation from Selection 51C, from which we'll sing stanzas 1, 3, and then 5 and 8. We'll do so standing if able, 1, 3, Five and eight of fifty one C.
Lord's scripture reading for the evening will be taken from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. This is found on page 1,343, if you're using the Pew Bible. Uh, A quite commonly well-known passage of Holy Scripture. We'll be reading the first 10 verses. After we read from the scriptures, we'll also be reading from our Canons of Dort, the third and the fourth heads of doctrine, Article 3, and in the Forms and Prayers book in the Pew Rack, you find that on page 271. We read then from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. The Apostle Paul writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thus far for now our reading from the Holy Scriptures, we then turn to Article 3 of the third and fourth main points of doctrine. And just notice the title that is given on the top of page 271 to these points of doctrine, human corruption. Uh, And that is the sober topic that we have before us this evening, human corruption. And Article 3 is entitled, Total Inability. Therefore, all people are conceived in sin and are born children of wrath, unfit for any saving good, inclined to evil, dead in their sins, and slaves to sin. Without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit, they are neither willing nor able to return to God, to reform their distorted nature, or even to dispose themselves to such reform. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and especially boys and girls and, and young people, the, the diagnosis of a person's condition determines the prescription. Now, you might say, well, you said you were going to talk to the boys and girls and you just rattled off that sentence. Let me explain. Boys and girls, if you have what we call a, a common cold, you know, you've, you've got a runny nose, you're sneezing, you know, your mom, your dad, and, and maybe if, you know, there's a doctor or a nurse in the family, they'll say, you know, what you really need is some rest, lots of fluids, and in a day or two, you'll feel better. So they just simply say, you need some rest, you need some fluids, because you just have a common cold. And given that you're young and relatively healthy, in a few days you'll be fine. Now, if, and we hope this doesn't happen, but, but if, if you're playing on the playground and you suddenly break your leg, and you go to Pella Regional Hospital and you go to the emergency room, and the doctor walks in and, and he sees your, your leg and maybe he orders an x-ray and it comes back and it confirms, yes, the leg is broken, and if he says to you, you know what you really need is a glass of water and a nap. And in a day or two, you will be fine. Well, you can imagine how silly that would be. You don't have a common cold. You have a broken leg. The leg maybe needs to be set, and maybe it needs to be put into a cast. And you'll have to wear that cast uh, maybe, maybe for two months. Because 
the condition impacts the remedy. And now all of this is to serve this point. We must understand humanity's spiritual condition in order to rightly understand the remedy. There's a correlation. What you, what I, what we believe about humanity's moral condition impacts what we believe about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Reformed theology, we talk about very areas of doctrine. One of the areas of doctrine is is that of anthropology, uh, the, the knowledge and the study of humanity, based, of course, upon the revelation of Scripture. Another area uh, we call soteriology, uh, the doctrine of salvation. And, and there's a connection. What you believe about anthropology, about humanity, will impact what you believe about soteriology. If you believe that humanity is basically good and just needs a little help to be better, then you'll have a soteriology, and also this will work it out in practice, then what the preaching will be is just kind of a go get them rally. You're great. You could be even better. Here's some tips on how to be even better. And indeed, you find that type of talk from many a pulpit on many a Sunday throughout our land. But if If you believe that human nature is corrupt, dead in sins and in trespasses, that will impact what you hear from the pulpit on Sundays. Then it will not be, you're great, you just need to be a little bit better. But then the proclamation will be, You're dead in your sins and trespasses except for the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Our theme tonight as we continue to unfold the doctrines of grace along the lines of what is commonly known as TULIP is sovereignty and salvation, redemption applied, part one. I know it's not the smoothest theme, but I think that captures what we hope to talk about this evening In connection with the acronym TULIP, which really should be all tip if you go in logical order, we are dealing with the T of total depravity. And as we notice this, we'll notice first of all the universal corruption of humanity, and then secondly, the condemned corruption of humanity, and then thirdly, the paralyzing corruption of humanity. So that corruption of humanity, where we're talking here about the impact of sinfulness, upon the human race. We'll notice that it is universal, that it brings about condemnation, and that it also brings about a certain spiritual paralysis. So first of all, then, the universal corruption of humanity. What is corrupt? What is, what is the object? Humanity. Now, we, we don't want to go too far off into the abstract theoretical realm, but But maybe to the young people and to those who hear these words, maybe you're studying at college and university, have you ever ever stepped back and thought, what is a human person? These types of questions and these types of topics are going to be important for the church to clarify, especially in the age in which we live. What is a human person? Well, much could be said, but we want to say the basics, human beings or human persons are individuals who are created by God. That is the first, the most fundamental element in the identification of what a human person is, an individual who is created by God. And being created by God A human person is an individual who bears the image of God. We know this because this is revealed for us in Scripture. The opening chapters, Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, 
he created them. Do you see how many absolute follies of our world would be solved with a submission to Genesis 1, 26 and 27? We are not the products of some vague evolutionary process. We are not the products of evolution. Our ancestors are not some type of animal. And I firmly believe that this is part, and I stress part, this is part of why our generations are characterized by angst, hopelessness, despair. If you're hearing these words tonight, you are not a product of evolution. You have been created by God, and you bear the image of God. You have a body, you have a soul, and with those two constitutional elements of your person, you were created with moral capacity, which the animals do not have which the inanimate creation does not have. A a capacity, an an, an ability to know God and and to love God and, and, and to serve God. But that also gives humanity a moral responsibility. Moral ability then brings with it moral responsibility. And this is revealed, of course, within Scripture as well. Uh, God gave to Adam that what we call a probationary command, a, a, a testing command. God said to Adam, and through Adam to Eve as well, you may not eat of this one particular tree. Now, Adam had moral ability and he had moral responsibility so that if he did eat of that tree, he would bring upon himself and through himself to all of the human race spiritual death. And we know the historical account well. We are taught it from our earliest years that at home and, and in the schools and in the, in the church. We know that Adam violated that commandment of God. And that is the cause of the universal corruption. Human beings, each and every individual, particular person created by God, bearing the image of God, and yet something has happened. So that we, by nature, apart from God's grace, are not as we once were. You see, if if you believe that we are just the products of an evolutionary process, well, then where is moral responsibility? I mean, dogs do what dogs do, and and, and cats do what cats do, and and cows do what cows do, and, and there's no moral responsibility. Sure, if a dog is rabied, maybe you you euthanize it, and you say, oh, good riddance, we're rid of that dog. But you don't say that dog sinned. But human beings are different. So what happened? What happened was this universal corruption that came upon the human race when Adam violated that commandment. Now we speak of total depravity, and and many, many, many a Reformed theologian and minister has helpfully clarified this does not mean, this does not mean that humanity is as sinful in its expressions of sin as it could possibly be. We are we are very grateful to God's providence, restraining the expression of sin. We're thankful, for the most part, that our communities are are relatively safe. We're thankful, for the most part, uh, that people drive on the right side of the road without wandering over the center line. We're thankful uh, that criminals are, are restrained. What we really mean here is what we could call a, a pervasive depravity or a pervasive corruption. This corruption of sinfulness is everywhere. 
It's spread all throughout our spiritual dimension. So that our thoughts are corrupted by sin. Our inclinations, our desires are corrupted by sin. Our will, what we want, is corrupted by sin. Our actions, it's like, it's like dust in a Dutch home. When the sunlight comes in through the window and you see it and it's everywhere, and you say, oh, I've got to get rid of this. I've got to get rid of this dust that's in the air, that's on the furniture. And, and, and once, once a Dutch housewife starts to dust, they keep dusting and they keep dusting because they see more and more and more. That's the way it is with sinfulness within our soul. It's everywhere. Well, what are we then to do? Well, we also need to acknowledge that this universal corruption of humanity brings a certain condemnation. And that's our second point. It'd be one thing if we could just say, well, that's too bad. By nature, we are what we are. It'd be one thing if you could just read Ephesians 2 verse 1 and notice the words he made alive are italicized. They're actually not in verse 1. The main verb is found all the way down in verse 5, made us alive together with Christ. So it's, it's, it's one long inspired run-on sentence describing this pervasive depravity. And you, verse 1, were dead in sins and trespasses. And the reality of that brings upon humanity a certain condemnation. Condemned to death on account of our sinfulness. And, and, and so look there at, at verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Now, I don't know any other way to read that verse and to be honest with the authority of Scripture than to say, this is the verdict. Apart from God's intervention, apart from God's grace, apart from God's work of regeneration, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, that's the verdict on you and that's the verdict on me. By nature... By nature of being a fallen son of Adam or a fallen daughter of Adam, a child of wrath, just as the others. Notice that every single human being is pooled together. And, and this is important for us to understand because humanity, we love to grade on a curve. We love to find someone whom we think is worse than ourselves. And then excuse ourselves. Maybe even compliment ourselves. And I check myself repeatedly and I hope that others check me as well. Isn't it remarkable? Absolutely remarkable. That individuals can be proud of their knowledge of total depravity. That individuals can walk around and go, I know more about total depravity than you do. I'm a better theologian. I've read Burkhoff and Bovink and maybe even Hooksima. And I can dot my theological I's and T's far, far, far better than you can, especially in the area of total depravity. By nature, children of wrath just as the others. This is the sentence upon the entire human race apart from the grace of God because of God's just judgment. 
I'd ask you to turn back in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and, and 19. God is a God of righteousness, and, and theologians make distinctions within God's righteousness. Uh, one aspect of God's righteousness is what we call His rectoral righteousness. Because God is God, He has the right to determine what is good and what is evil. Now, he does not do that arbitrarily. He does that in line with his own nature. So, everything that is in line with God's holiness is good. For example, telling the truth is morally good because God is a God of truth. Fidelity in relationships, especially within covenantal relationships such as marriage, is good because God is a covenantally faithful God. Theft, on the other hand, for example, is evil because God is a God who works, not a God who steals. A lying, for example, also is evil because God is a God of truth, and the father of lies is actually the devil. So God does not just arbitrarily come up with, well, I think this should be good, I think that should be evil, but as an expression of his very nature, God has the right to establish that which is morally good and that which is morally evil. That's his rectoral justice. But then also God has the right, and may we say the the duty, the responsibility to reward that which is good, which we call retributive justice, remunerative justice, and to punish that which is evil, which we call retributive justice. God has to punish evil. Not because He's compelled by some outside source or some greater source, but because He's God. And God does punish evil, as as we see very clearly here in Romans 5, verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, reflecting here upon Adam's sin and the pervasive depravity that included the entirety of the human race, notice this, resulting in condemnation. It wasn't just that Adam and his posterity could go, oops, sorry, we sinned. Will you just look the other way? Will you just ignore that? Can we, can we have a, a moral mulligan, kind of a, a do-over? We tried our best. We didn't really know. We didn't really understand. These types of excuses don't reckon with the reality of the righteousness of God. One man's offense Judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Now, there's a wonderful second part of verse 18. We'll come to that truth in our third point. But notice verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Or in the words of Ephesians 2, By nature, children of wrath. Well, why do we belabor this point? So that in part, if you flip back one more page, we might come to the repeated acknowledgement of what is stated in Romans 3, verse 19. You notice in the preceding verses, the Apostle Paul strings a bunch of Old Testament quotes together, especially from the Psalms, all emphasizing what we might call the pervasive depravity or the total depravity of humanity. And he kind of summarizes it all up with verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. Why, Paul? Why are you making this argument? Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what needs to happen. That's one of the purposes of the law and the preaching of the law. And it is an extreme purpose, but it has a glorious reason behind it. Why do we want every mouth to be stopped? Why do we want the excuses and and the attempts to self-justify? Why do we want them stopped? Because it's only when the mouths are stopped that the eyes then look to grace. 
You can think of this in the terms of the the two thieves who were crucified alongside of Jesus Christ. They both began those hours of crucifying by, by hurling insults upon the Lord. They were giving nearly full vent to the reality of their depravity. But then a change took place. And the repentant thief stopped his mouth. And when he did speak, he acknowledged his guilt. He said to the other thief who kept on rallying, we deserve this. We deserve this. And it's only then when he acknowledges what he is receiving is just, it's only then that he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's only when we are convinced of the reality in a personal, experiential way within our soul of our own depravity that will then cry out for mercy and for grace. And that begins to transition us into our third point of consideration, the paralyzing corruption of humanity. Uh, Notice again, if we can refer you back to Article 3, Total Inability, We talk about total depravity or pervasive depravity, which then produces a total inability. Therefore, all people are conceived in sin and are born children of wrath, unfit for any saving good, inclined to evil, dead in their sins, and slaves of sin. Without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit, they are neither willing nor able to return to God. A human person, apart from the grace of God, is not able, not able to believe, not able to repent, not able to return to God. They're dead in their sins and trespasses. Now, changing the analogy slightly, if, if an individual were to physically die, sometimes I've used this analogy in teaching catechism and, and when I used to teach Christian doctrine, if an individual flatlines underneath a cardiac arrest, it would be most futile to stand over him and say, get up! Walk it off. They're flatlining underneath cardiac arrest. They're not able to get up. They're not able to walk it off. They they don't have the ability. Nor, I would suppose, in that condition, do they have the desire to get up and walk it off. Because they don't have the ability, they they don't have the desire. And and this is what is so concerning about the prosperity gospel and and the the self-help gurus. Don't tell dead sinners to just go out and do better. They can't do better. And they don't really want to do better. Sure, maybe they want to hide their evil behind a facade of external moral conformity. But a sinner who's dead in his sins and trespasses isn't able to change himself or herself and doesn't really want to. This helps explain what is commonly misunderstood. It's not as if Reformed theology keeps people away from Christ. It's not as if Reformed theology pushes sinners away from Christ. Unregenerated sinners 
do not want Christ. And so they will not come to Christ. Unless. And there is a beautiful unless woven, and I want to begin first of all with the canons of Dort, and then we'll go to Scripture to first of all once again show that our canons are scriptural in, in, their, in their essence. Did you see that phrase? And we kind of passed over it because Lord willing will return to it next Sunday night when we consider the truth of irresistible grace. Right in the middle of Article 3, without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit. So there is hope. Sinners in their natural state are unwilling and unable to return to God. But there is hope. And that hope is also what is bound up in verse 4 of Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And so to go back to the earlier analogy, if an individual is experiencing cardiac arrest, lying on the floor, unable to move, unwilling to move, it would be cruel to just simply stand over that person and say, get up, walk it off. But if you could find an instrument to send an electrical current to the heart, if you were able to restart the heart, there's hope. And and, and what is the instrument that can restart a dead soul? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who brings a person from death to life. It's the Holy Spirit along with the Word of God that gives that first heartbeat of repentance and faith. And it may be a weak heartbeat, and it may be an inconsistent heartbeat, but it's a heartbeat. And it may, for many of us, have not even been a a, a spiritual heartbeat of faith and repentance that we were conscious of. It may have occurred in our mother's womb or when we were little infants sitting under the preaching of the Word when maybe at times our parents, although they exercised great faith by bringing us underneath the preaching of the Word, maybe they thought to themselves, you know, why why do I have this five-year-old here? Because the Spirit works mysteriously His wonders to perform. And the Spirit blesses the preaching of the Word, the foolishness of the preaching of the Word, even into the hearts and souls of of infants and children. And as the Spirit brings that message of the Gospel home through the ear into the soul, the soul begins to beat with the life of repentance and faith. And as that child or a young person or a new convert continues to receive the instruction of the gospel, the heartbeat gets stronger and stronger and stronger as they exercise faith in Jesus Christ. And so, yes, the human predicament from one perspective is dark, but in the darkness of human corruption and depravity shines the brilliancy of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our time is exhausted, but in God's good providence, we anticipate coming and returning to this theme next Sunday night. But God makes alive those who are dead. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, We do acknowledge the solemnity of our predicament apart from your sovereign grace. By nature, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, we are those who were described in Ephesians 2. Uh, We are those dead in our trespasses and sins, but we, while we soberly take recognition of that fact, we rejoice in your great goodness, your grace, and your love. 
especially evident in the regenerating, quickening, making alive work of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that even tonight, as these words go forth, that sinners might be converted, that individuals might pass from spiritual death to spiritual life, that repentance and faith might be exercised for the first time or by way of continued renewal in the lives of your people, so that your name might be honored and glorified by us. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll then turn to song selection 391, uh, a prayerful hymn. We'll stand, if able, as we sing all four stanzas of 391. This evening we present our offering for Pathways of Pella. After the deacons have taken up that collection, we'll stand as we sing our evening doxology, the two stanzas of 564, Now Blessed Be Jehovah God.
And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God with the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.